So good to see everybody this Lord's Day morning. I want to encourage you to have your Bible out and, and have it limbered up. It's going to be another one of those kind of sermons. We are going to take a look at answering a question that has been submitted. We started this calendar year devoting the fifth Sunday morning sermons in the 11 o'clock hour to addressing questions that have been submitted by members. And this morning, I want to address and see what the Bible has to say about some questions that were submitted regarding demon possession. And uh, I ask that the questions be submitted in writing, and, and these were. And we're going to look at some specific questions that were submitted, but I want us to, to back up and to take a look at this subject in a more broad sense, and then along the way address some of these questions. Realize this sermon on demon possession is going to be more of an informator informatory type of sermon rather than one that is designed to encourage or to, uh, uh, to motivate us to serve the Lord. But if we're going to understand Christ and we're going to understand His power and His mission and His identity, if we're going to understand the Gospels and the book of Acts, we need to know about demon possession. We need to know what the Bible teaches on this subject. So that's what we're going to dive into this morning. So good to see everyone with us, especially those who are visiting with us. I've, I've met, we've got a visitor from Tennessee making his way through the area, and uh, some old friends of ours from Joliet, Illinois, are, are with us who are making their way back to Illinois from North Carolina. Haven't seen, we haven't seen each other in it's been over 19 years since we've seen each other, so it's good to see some old faces, familiar faces, bring back some good memories, and, and sitting in a pew reminded me that one of these days we're going to have a homecoming and we're going to have a reunion that's going to be great uh, when we gather around our Father's throne in, in heaven. So we look forward to that. I want us to, to look at, at this subject of demon possession. Where, I want to begin by answering the question, where did demons come from? We don't have, Sophie, you, you don't know, you don't know. Now, I appreciate that from Sophie. Sometimes I solicit answers from our young people. So, uh, so I appreciate you paying attention, Sophie. Uh, but let's wait till after the lesson, then you can answer the question. Uh, you know, the Bible doesn't specifically say where demons come from. Uh, so we have to, we have to understand, uh, put the pieces together, if you will, of where demons have come from. Demons... Uh, the Bible also calls them unclean spirits or evil spirits. All three terms will be used. Uh, it's referring to the same thing, talking about demons and demon possession. Uh, Josephus tells us that the Jews of Jesus' day believed that demons were the spirits of wicked men who had died. And that was the, the belief at large held by the Jewish community. Uh, as you look at the Restoration Movement, Alexander Campbell held that view as well, and that was back just in the 1800s. There are some problems with this view. There's no biblical support for it, and demons appear to possess a knowledge and a power that humans don't have. Another, uh, another view is that demons are disembodied spirits of a superior but rebellious race of creatures who inhabited the earth prior to the creation of Adam. That's really getting out there, really getting out there to find a, a, uh, an explanation for who demons are. There's no biblical support for that view. Another view is that demons are the offspring of a perverse mating between angels and human women. And this would be those who would take the sons of God, recorded in Genesis 6 verse 2, as being angels. Jesus tells us that angels do not reproduce. Uh, so that does away with that view. The, the, best, the best response that we can come to is that Satan and the demons are fallen angels. The Bible does not specifically identify demons with fallen angels, but it is entirely reasonable for us to draw this kind of a conclusion. There are many similarities between angels and demons. We'll look at some of those as we go through this study, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 mentions angels who sinned. So angels have sinned, and, and Peter says that they have been reserved for judgment. Jude 
And the book of Jude is a repetition in a lot of ways of the material found in 2 Peter chapter 2. Jude verse 6 speaks of angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. What does that mean? Well, that, that means they sinned. I believe these two verses help to explain one another. Sin is a transgression. And what happened? These angels apparently transgressed an abode or a boundary that God had confined them to. And so they sinned and they rebelled against God. I, I believe that they followed Satan in this rebellion against God's authority. In the book of 1 Timothy, at chapter 3, we read of the qualifications of elders. And, and of all places, why would you go to a passage like this and talking about demons? Well, th there's a statement made, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and at verse 6, that an elder cannot be a novice. That is, he cannot be a new Christian, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. So we're having to put some pieces together here, but apparently Satan sinned in following through with his pride, and he rebelled against the confines that God placed around he and other angels. He took the lead in this, and other angels followed him. We know from Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41, Jesus describes eternal hell as a place that's prepared for the devil and his angels. So where did, where did demons come from? Where did Satan come from? In this study this morning, we're going to take the view that demons are fallen angels. If you've got a, a different view, if you've got some information on where demons have originated from and would like to share those verses with me after services, I'd be glad to see what you have to share. What are some characteristics of demons? Well, if they are fallen angels then there are some things that we can understand about demons. Number one, they are spiritual beings. They are not physical beings. They're not flesh and blood. But they are spiritual beings. They are immortal beings. They're not eternal. They haven't always existed. But they were created. And from that time, they will exist forever. So they are immortal. That is, they, are, uh, they will exist forever. We know also that angels are powerful beings. Angels, and then fallen angels, demons, certainly are not omnipotent. They do not have the power that God has, but we know that they are certainly more powerful than humans are. In Hebrews chapter 2, in Hebrews chapter 2, when the Hebrew writer is telling us that the Son of God took on flesh, when he did that, that put him in a station, or that put him in a position that was actually of lower rank than the angels. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 uh, at, at verse 9 says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So angels, spiritual beings, demons are of a more powerful rank than man. So demons do have power. They don't have the power that's equal with God, with deity, but they are more powerful than man. We know that demons have knowledge. As we look at the New Testament, we know that there are some things that demons know. For one, demons believe in the one true living God. In James chapter 2, we often go to this chapter to talk about faith and works, the kind of faith that saves and the kind of faith that does not. Just believing is not enough because James 2 and at verse 19 says, You believe that there is one God, you do well, even the demons believe and tremble. So the demons believe in the true living God. They don't believe that there are all different kinds of gods. They don't believe in, in, in paganism. They believe in the true living God. But this belief doesn't do them any good at all. They tremble. They tremble when they think of the true and living God. They also believe in Jesus. If you turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, one thing that's interesting is as Jesus begins His ministry, uh, some of the miracles He's performing include casting out demons. As a matter of fact, the first miracle Jesus performs in the Gospel of Mark is casting out a demon. But what's interesting about these demons is that while Jesus is first introducing Himself, 
and he's allowing other people to come to realize who he is, the demons already know who he is. And they freely announce, you are the Christ, you are the Son of God. So they know already who Jesus is. Mark chapter 1 and verse 24, uh, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, verse 24, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So notice, not only do they know who Jesus is, but they also know their fate. Remember, James said that the demons believe and they tremble. Why? Because they know what's waiting for them. And here, uh, have you come to destroy us? They know what their fate is. In Matthew chapter 8, in verse 29, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8, and at verse 29, as I said, it's going to be one of those sermons. We're going to look at a number of verses. Chapter 8, and at verse 29, and suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? You have, have you come here to torment us before the time? So again, they know Him, and they know of their fate. Not only do the demons know God and know Jesus, but they also know those who are His people. Turn with me to Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19... Here we have the, the uh, gospel spreading into Ephesus. And Ephesus was a city that was given over to sorcery. And so to combat that, God allowed some very unusual and fascinating miracles to occur while Paul was there in that city. And we read here of some individuals attempting to cast out demons. Acts chapter 19, start at verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? So see, they, they knew Jesus, and they also knew Paul. They knew the Lord's apostles, but they didn't recognize these men. That is, they didn't recognize these men as having authority over them to cast them out. Uh, read verse 16, Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. So here's something else about demons. We're going to see that, that they have power. And those who are demon-possessed would exercise superhuman power. Something else about demons, although they, uh, although they rebelled against God and rebelled against God's authority, they are under God's sovereign authority. That is, God places limitations on them that they cannot go beyond. They, they could rebel against Him and leave their proper abode. Whatever that was, whenever that was, that happened. But we read in other places where God places limitations on Satan and by extension on his angels. Uh, in Job chapter 1, many of us are familiar with this, when uh, Satan is, is tempting God to, to cause Job to suffer, God placed a limitation on that, chapter 1 and verse 12, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. There was a limitation placed there. Satan had to honor that limitation. In chapter 2 and at verse 6, uh, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. Again, there's a limitation placed there, and Satan honored that limitation. So he had to abide within that boundary, within that control that God placed upon him. This comes into play, I believe, when we consider a, a passage like 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. This is a very powerful passage for us. It helps us as we are struggling with temptations. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Notice, God's involved here. 
God's involved, but we know God is not doing the tempting. James chapter 1 says God does not tempt us to sin, but when we are being tempted, God is present. He is involved. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Every time we're tempted, God is placing a limitation on that temptation. He does not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able In Luke chapter 22, I believe it is, Jesus lets Peter know that Satan has asked for him to sift him as wheat. He had to get permission to do that. He couldn't go beyond what God allowed. Uh, In Luke chapter 4 and verse 36, the people were amazed that the, the demons were obeying Jesus that they were responding to His authority. Luke chapter 4 and at verse 36, they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is! For with authority and power He commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. So as we're reading through the New Testament, we we combine the things that we know about angels, and we take things that the Bible specifically says about demons, and we can put them together, and we can learn some things about demons what demons are, what their nature is. They are unclean spirits. They are evil spirits. There's no good in them whatsoever. No good in Satan whatsoever. They mean to upset the goodness that God created. They mean to upset God's people from serving Him. But they are the devil's ministers. They are the devil's angels. What about the the question of demon possession? Does demon possession occur in the Bible? Well, yes, it does. But you know, you might be interested to to see this, to know this. It doesn't occur in the Old Testament. You only read of demon possession occurring in the New Testament. If you know of an incident of it happening in the Old Testament, let me know. Let Sophie and I know. We want to know about it. Uh, But what I found, it doesn't exist in the Old Testament, just in the New Testament. Matter of fact, demons are only mentioned four times in the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 7, sorry, Leviticus. Leviticus 17, verse 7, Deuteronomy 32, 17, 2 Chronicles 11, 15, and Psalms 106, verse 37. Just in those four passages, and all four of those passages are talking about idolatry. And so demons are connected with idolatry. That's why when we come to the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, when Paul is talking about Christians going to these idol temples and celebrating these feasts in these idol temples, he talks about them them taking the cup and taking the bread and taking the altar of demons. Demons are connected with idol worship. So we have demons mentioned in the Old Testament, but there's no mention of demon possession in the Old Testament. It's when we come to the New Testament that we have accounts of demon possession. In the New Testament, demon possession manifested itself in an individual being impaired in some manner. Oftentimes they had maladies like blindness or they were mute. And then when these demons were cast out, They received these abilities back. Uh, Some of them had epilepsy and would fall into fits uh, at times. There are other times that they would cause harm to themselves or they would try to cause harm to other people. Uh, Sometimes they would possess supernatural strength. Turn with me to Mark chapter 5. We read already in Acts chapter 19 of that demon-possessed man who was able to overpower five men and drive them out of the house naked. So there is an example of supernatural strength. Uh, In Mark chapter 5, Jesus encounters a man of the Gadarenes who is possessed by demons. He's described for us, that is his condition, how pitiful his condition is. In Mark chapter 5, Uh, start at verse uh, verse 2. Let's start at verse 2. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, 
and the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. So here's this demon. Here's a very, very extreme example of a man who is demon possessed. He could not be contained, he could not be confined. He broke out of chains and shackles. Again, a very extreme example, but it's recorded in three gospel accounts for us. So there's a reason it's recorded. Jesus overcomes this demon. And we find out it's not just one demon, but it's many. And that tells us that more than one demon could possess one person. We read on, look at verse 9. He asked him, what is your name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. So there are so many there, they called themselves Legion. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. So here again, the, these demons recognized the authority of Jesus and recognized their fate. They asked to be sent into swine, and the herd of swine uh, runs down into the sea, and we're told in verse 13 that it was about 2,000 swine. Does that mean there were 2,000 demons in this man? I don't know about that. But there was a multitude. Enough that they called themselves legion. So, as we read the New Testament, we see that people who were demon-possessed were in desperate need for help. They were in desperate need for help, and there's no record of anyone being delivered from a demon, being exercised of a demon, without the exercise of divine power. No example of someone just calling the name of Jesus on someone, or performing some kind of a ritual, or saying a certain prayer, and all of a sudden the demons are gone. No, those who cast demons out had power to do so. We know that Jesus had this power. He exercised this power. But the apostles had this power as well. And the gospel specifically says so. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 1, it says, Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. So the twelve had divine power to cast out demons. Chapter 10 of Luke tells us that by extension, the seventy who were sent out on a commission also must have been given this power because verse 17 says, Then the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So Jesus had divine power. He gave this power to the apostles. He gave this power to the seventy. We know that Philip, the evangelist, had this power as well. In Acts chapter 8, when he goes to Samaria, not only does he preach the kingdom, but he also drives out demons. He also casts demons out of individuals. Paul had this power. In Acts chapter 16, when he comes to Philippi, there is that servant girl that had a, a spirit that gave her the power of divination. And she followed him around and, and pestered him. And he cast out that demon. And of course, the owners of that slave girl delivered him to jail. And that's where he and Silas got beat and thrown into prison. But Paul had that power. Here's something else. If you turn with me to Matthew chapter 12... Jesus at least makes mention of the claim that the disciples of the Pharisees had to cast out demons. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus cast out a demon, and, and the, his enemies, the Pharisees, say, yes, but he cast them out by Be the power of Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. So they can't deny he's casting out demons, but... And they realize power is being exercised, but they, they want to discredit Jesus, so they say he's doing this by the power of demons. And Jesus has to respond to this. And one of, the, one of the things he says is in verse 27, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. You can't cast out demons by the power of, of Satan. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And so Satan isn't going to be operating this way. Now, whether the disciples of the Pharisees really were casting out demons or not, to me is in question. What Jesus is acknowledging here at the very least is that they're claiming to do so. And what power are they claiming to use when they do this? So again, it would have to be the power of God given to an individual in some way. We don't have a record of demons being cast out 
without someone exercising divine power. I want to come to one of our specific questions that was given to me. Does demon possession occur today? Obviously, it occurred in the Bible. Does it occur today? Some people claim that it does. You can read books that have been written by people. I haven't done this, but I'm sure you can go on the internet and go on YouTube and find scores of people affirming the fact that demon possession occurs today. Hollywood certainly has cashed in on the idea, haven't they? I mean, for several decades now, you've had the Exorcist movie and all those movies that spring out from that. And I'm sure many horror movies, I don't watch those. That's not my thing. Uh, I'm sure many of them have aspects of their movies that are connected with demon possession. So Hollywood's cashed in on this idea. Some people believe in it. And oftentimes the claims are, yes, it's happening in some tribe way off over here, which you and I will never go and visit. And we can never verify that for ourselves, but it's happening way over here. And again, it's happening in connection with idolatry, where idolatry is happening. So, you know, we can hear claims made by people that it does happen. What I'm wondering is if this book right here teaches whether or not demon possession occurs today or not. What does the Bible have to say about this? That's one of the questions that was given to me. And so here are my thoughts regarding this. Demon possession didn't occur in the Old Testament. It didn't occur then, but God appears to have allowed it to occur during the time of His Son's ministry and the early spread of the gospel into this world. God allowed things to happen so that when His Son came on the scene, His Son could exercise His divine power and show who He was. In the Gospel of John at chapter 9, the Gospel of John in chapter 9, Jesus and his disciples, his apostles, encounter a man who is born blind. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They're simply... They're simply showing that the, the prevalent thought of that day that if anyone suffered any kind of major misfortune, it was because they sinned or it was because their family sinned. That's what Job's friends were going on back in the book of Job. Job, you've suffered terribly. God punishes sinners. You've got to be a terrible sinner. And that sets up the whole dialogue that runs through the book of Job. Well, by Jesus' day, they hadn't learned any better. Here they are, here's someone in a terrible state. Who sinned that caused this to happen? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. God providentially allowed this man to be born this way and to be there on that occasion so Jesus could show the power of God. I believe the same thing is behind demon possession. We don't read of it in the Old Testament, but when Jesus comes on the scene, it's a present reality. And Jesus sets forth casting out demons. Jesus cast out demons as a sign. Just like every other miracle that Jesus did, it was primarily a sign to prove who He was and to prove the message that He was preaching. Look in Luke. Chapter 4. We read, verse, or we read verse 36 a few moments ago. Let's look at this text again. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is! For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. There's something different about this man. We've never seen anyone do this before. This man has power. This man has authority. In Matthew chapter 12, we just read verse 27. Jesus is accused of casting out demons by Beelzebub. Well, who do your sons say they cast demons out? Let them, let them inform you on this. Let them be your judge. The very next verse, Jesus says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
It was a sign. It was a sign to show them, yes, the kingdom is present. You better listen to this man, Jesus. You better not discount him. You better not try to debunk him. You better not blaspheme his name as you're doing. You better listen to him. He is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. In Mark chapter 16, we read that there were various miraculous signs that would accompany believers to confirm that they were believers. Mark 16, verses 17 and 18, And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. We've got five signs that are given here. As we study passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we realize the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit served a temporary purpose, and when the Word was confirmed and delivered in whole, by then the miraculous gifts had been passed out. They, they were gone. The apostles died so they could no longer lay their hands on believers. And when that generation died, those gifts were gone. So, do we have people speaking with tongues today? Not legitimately, no. Do we have people laying their hands on the sick today and healing them? No. Do we have people being bit by vipers and surviving? You've got snake handling churches today. But every once in a while you read of the adherents of that religion getting bit by a snake and dying. So... No, these, these don't happen today. What, is that, what are we to conclude about the first item on this list then? No, that doesn't happen today either. Why not? These signs were given to confirm a truth that has been confirmed. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles, that would include casting out demons in that list, various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. The whole purpose for this has been served. The identity of Jesus has been confirmed. The, the gospel of the kingdom has been confirmed. So the, the purpose of casting out demons, and thus God allowing demon possession, it has been served. No longer exists. There's something else we need to consider. Jesus came into this world to destroy the power of the devil. In the book of 1 John at chapter 3, and verse 8. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Did you get that? The devil sinned from the beginning. Where did the devil come from? An angel that sinned. He sinned from the beginning. But did you get the, the second part of this verse? The Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. Now, he did this in part when He died on the cross and rose again in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, and I realize we're, we're darting 2 and 4 uh, in, our, in our Bibles, but we're, we're pulling information together here. Jesus has destroyed the power of Satan, the works of the devil, he did this in his death, burial, and resurrection. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. When Jesus died on the cross, Satan played his trump card. That was the, the biggest, most powerful weapon he had, death. He played it. Three days later, Jesus trumped it. Jesus defeated it. He came forth from the dead with death no longer having power over Him. And through the salvation that He offers us, we know that we will one day conquer death as well. But there was something else that Jesus did when He died on the cross. Colossians chapter 2 helps us to see some of these things. 
Colossians chapter 2, this is a passage we turn to when we're talking about how the law of Moses has been done away with. It was nailed to the cross. There it was fulfilled, it served its purpose, and so it was nailed to the cross and there it died with Jesus. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 says, Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now look at verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. When Jesus died on the cross, he defeated death. When Jesus died on the cross, he took the old law out of the way. When Jesus died on the cross, he disarmed principalities and powers. He took away their power. He disarmed them. Who are these principalities and powers? Well, let's end up where we started with our scripture reading in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and at verse 12, we need to put on the whole armor of God, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Remember, demons are spiritual beings, not flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. That is the devil and his angels. Those are the demons. And what did Jesus do when he died on the cross? He disarmed those demons. He took away their power. Well, oh, preacher, that sounds well and good, but then we get into the book of Acts after Jesus has died and we still have demon possession. Yes, we do. We have demon possession as the gospel is continuing to go out into the world for the first time and is continuing to be confirmed. But after it's been confirmed, all these miracles are done away with, including casting out demons. And I believe it's logical for us to conclude that God allowed demon possession to take place during a specific time in human history so that Jesus and his apostles could manifest the power of the gospel over the power of Satan and sin. That's how I would answer this question. Does demon possession occur today? No, it does not. I believe the Bible teaches that it doesn't. Demon possession is a Bible subject. Again, if we're going to better understand the gospels and better understand the power of Christ, and better understand the book of Acts, we need to know something about this subject. But to be honest with you, I probably would have never preached this if I hadn't been asked the question about demon possession. So this is an informatory type of study, and I believe we can leave here better equipped to understand the Gospels, to understand the book of Acts. And we can leave here better equipped to have discussions with our friends and with our neighbors. And we can leave here with a, a better understanding and appreciation of what Jesus did for us while he was here and the power that Jesus has. If we're serving the Lord, we are on the right side. We are serving the one who has won. Demon possession was allowed to occur so Jesus and his apostles could demonstrate the power of God over the power of the devil and to confirm the facts of the gospel. And once these facts were confirmed, there was no longer any need for this power to be demonstrated so I believe we can conclude that God no longer allows demon possession to take place today. I believe that's what the Bible teaches on this subject. Appreciate so very much your kind attention. If you are here and you are not yet a Christian, not yet a child of God, the fact that Jesus conquered the demons doesn't help you. Doesn't help you. The fact that Jesus did away with the old law. The fact that Jesus conquered death in and of itself doesn't help you. You have to avail yourself of the gift that Jesus made possible with that death. The forgiveness of your sins is available and is offered to each of us freely through the gospel if we would just take it. If we would take it on His terms. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's where you start. But just believing doesn't do you any good. The demons believe and tremble. No, we've got to act on that belief. If we believe in Jesus, we need to believe what He said. He said, repent 
or perish. He said, confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. He said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's what we have to do in order to be saved. If you're ready and willing to do that, there's no better time for you to become a Christian than right here and right now. Maybe as a Christian, you're struggling with something in your life and you would like our prayers on your behalf. Maybe you need to make things right in a public way. Whatever your spiritual need is, would you let it be made known by coming forward as we stand and sing this invitation song?